All right, folks, we are, it's 8.03. So we are going to start tonight's evenings with Artifacts. Good evening, everyone. My name is Heather Nickerson, co-founder and CEO of Artifacts. We have a great program in store for you tonight. To say that we are giddy here at Artifacts is an understatement. Um, Ellen and I both brought props for this evening, which you'll be hearing more about throughout the, the night and the conversation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ellen to do her introduction and also introduce our esteemed speaker for tonight. And as always, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We will be taking questions um, at the end, and we hope to have plenty of time for all of you to ask whatever's on your mind after listening to tonight's conversation. So with that, Ellen. Thanks, Heather. Hi, everybody. Ellen Goodwin, co-founder of Artifacts, if you don't know me already. And Gina and I met not that long ago, actually, through a professional genealogist that we are both friends with and associates. And it was um, only because of my excitement about the cooking and recipes that we've been seeing roll in through Artifacts that, that our mutual contact, Thomas McKinty, thought to introduce us. And why was he right? Because Gina's background... <laughs> is, I would say, not just uh, to diminish it, but I mean, see, see all those cookbooks behind her? I mean, this woman knows her stuff. Um, but she has a double master's degree in interdisciplinary studies and religion. She's written and taught all over the country for genealogy folks and non. Um, and I think that her focus on material culture and the weaving in of women's history and family history to material culture couldn't be a better fit with artifacts. So we are very happy to have you here tonight, Gina. And she did tell us in the green room that she could do like 10 different talks on this and, and not repeat anything. So we might have her come back. Hi, Gina. Hi, how are you guys? Great. We're happy to have you here. And the floor is yours. Wonderful. Well, you know, I do love cookbooks. And um, I, I take genealogy from a different point of view, because I don't just look at uh, the names and dates and the places. I try to add social history and material culture with it. Now, my great grandmother was a cook. And uh, so I do have some of that in my background. But really, how this came about was one day, I was at an antique store. And I saw all those funny 1950s cookbooks, you know, that you know, you open them up and there's the, you know, the jello salad that has meat in it and that and that kind of thing. And it just got me thinking, what about, did people eat this? And, you know, was this a hot cookbook? And it, it just got me thinking about how we research women. And so that led me to collect community cookbooks, which I'll talk a little bit about. And then it just kind of exploded. So let me uh, bring up my slides. So Oh, it says you've disabled screen sharing. <laughs> so as soon as that's enabled. Oh, let's try that one more time. That's not okay. supposed to be. Got it. Perfect. Okay. All right. So we are going to look at different ways your 20th century family answered the question, what's for dinner? And I don't know about you, but that is the most hated question. I hate that, especially when it's asked of me during breakfast. Now, why does food history matter to family history? And, and I'm coming from it that way. You may not be, but um, that's how I come from it. And I like this little quote that the kitchen is the heart of every home and for the most part and invokes memories of your family history. I think that's true. I think when we think about family history and we consider holidays like Thanksgiving, for example, uh, or birthday celebrations, whether your family were horrible cooks or good cooks, I think that it does bring up memories. Now, how did they learn what to cook or how to cook. Let's look at some cookbook examples and some of the ways they would have. And I decided to just look at 20th century because to me, that's the most, you know, recent for us. It's something we may remember some of these people. And so I just think it's better. Now, just so you know, 
there weren't always printed, you know, beautiful cookbooks like we have today. And there was this tradition of women gathering recipes from other women they knew and writing them down in some kind of bound form. Now, sometimes they would get ledger books and reuse those. Sometimes they would have papers that they would stitch together. This is a long tradition that goes way beyond the 20th century. So, for example, this is one in my collection. It is a ledger, and uh, the person who owned it wrote and also pasted in newspaper recipes. Now, obviously, because she's pasting in newspaper recipes, this is uh, largely from the 20th century, though some of the different recipes predate that. And, you know, when we look at something like this, especially if there's no names attached, we're not really sure what possessed them. Like this one actually has a lot of oyster recipes. And I can imagine why. But you know, my guess is that these are recipes she wanted to try and that included ingredients that she liked. You know, obviously you're not going to save things that you don't like and you would never use. And she did write in some recipes that she was handed down by different family and friends. And these recipes were everything from desserts to at the very bottom, I don't know if you can see it, it says it's for indigo blue, so it's a dye. Remember that women are using what we consider cookbooks, but recipe books for things other than cooking. These are homemaking handbooks. They are writing uh, recipes for how to clean different things, how to uh, help their family who is ill or suffering, how to create dyes for fabric. So it's a little bit of everything. So we consider recipes food, but it's not always that way. Now, these manuscript cookbooks, we still see them today. In fact, I get a whole bunch when I go to antique stores that are in the, to the 1940s, 1950s. Sometimes even today, you can buy uh, various books to write your family recipes in. And I would highly recommend when you go to a bookstore and they have these blank books that you get them and at your next family function, like Thanksgiving, for example, pass them around and ask somebody, everybody to provide one recipe and just have them write it right there. Bring, you know, pens and the whole bit. If you want to add stickers, you can add stickers, but get them to write down their recipes because it does two things. It gives you those favorite family recipes, but it also gives it to you in their handwriting. And so you have something that you can later artifact, that you can treasure. So it becomes a part of your family history and you can you know, keep bringing it out till you fill the whole thing. Now, that manuscript cookbook had newspapers that were pasted in, probably with a flour paste. They weren't using Elmer's glue. And, you know, that's not unusual to see that home cooks use various recipes they find in the newspaper. So let's talk about newspapers. And this is going to be a larger subject that includes cookbooks. So that's why we're going to talk about it. So about 1890, you start seeing women's pages in newspapers. And these are pages that deal with things that women care about. So recipes, uh, clothing, fashion, crafts, uh, what's going on in different women's groups, that kind of thing, announcements for marriages, all of that. Now, that's not to say that recipes don't appear before 1890. They do. But finally, we get a whole page where these recipes, either food writers, whoever was the editor of the women's page, or women themselves are providing these recipes. One of the ways they did it is like what's shown here in 1920. This is when you need your reading glass, glasses, 1928, I think. And that is recipe contests. What's easier to get recipes in your newspaper than to ask people to send them in? And so what happens is they would run recipe contests and they would have, you know, this week it's our cake contest or during rationing, which we're going to talk about, uh, give us your best bread recipe using rationed items. 
So they would encourage women readers to write in. And what would happen is they would, you know, receive a some kind of prize, like, you know, a dollar, for example. But most importantly for us is it would include their names and addresses. So if you look at the very far left column, there's Marie's Soup, uh, and it's by Mrs. E. V. Kellogg, and it gives you her street address. And then it just continues on. Now, obviously, these are usually local readers, but it can include women from outside the area. It's, it's basically readers. So this is something that you see probably starting about early 1900s, you know, about 1901-ish, and that continues on. And it's a source of pride, obviously, to have your recipe featured. It has your uh, name and address. I've seen where it even includes photos. So this is part of something we see even later on with things like Pillsbury. You know, they start recipe contests and baking contests. So it's something where women are providing recipes that they care about. Now, so they've got the women's pages. They're asking women for their recipes. And unlike what a lot of people think happens, not everybody knew how to cook. And they needed new ideas for what's for dinner. So newspapers realized that there could be some money made by running cooking schools. So what would happen is women who were, um, they worked for companies like Martha Logan or they were just home ec type teachers or independent cooking instructors would put on multi-day cooking schools sponsored by the newspaper. And you would either receive a ticket for being a subscriber or you would pay for a ticket. You would go to these large auditoriums, either like the movie theater or a high school auditorium. And on stage would be the teacher, the lecturer, and she would have a, a stove and a fridge and the whole nine yards. And over a course of several days, she would not only show you how to cook various foods, but there would be great giveaways. And at the end, somebody would win that stove or that fridge or a basket of fruit. Now, when these were going on, you would have pages of advertisements like this one from the cooking school itself, but also all the sponsors. And the sponsors are all the local, uh, you know, retailers, everything from the grocery store to the appliance store to even, you know, they would have the local hairdresser say, I did her hair and, you know, just everything you can think of. Everybody would get into this. Now, this was extremely popular from about the 1920s till about the 40s, maybe 50s, and you see it going uh, kind of dying down. Because what happens is we start getting things like television cooking shows or women who do these kinds of demonstrations at uh, department stores. And so the, the newspaper cooking school kind of dies out. So those women would go and put on these shows. This is one of my favorite. This is something I researched. So um, Jessie Marie DeBooth, she, uh, you could purchase at the cooking school a little kind of a brochure with the recipe she was going to show that day. And that way you could follow along and then you could go home and try it yourself. And so sometimes you might see these, you might see little tickets. Uh, Jesse actually also did a cookbook that would have been uh, sold at the cooking school. But this is one way that women learned how to cook is they would go with their friends, maybe family members, and enjoy a day uh, being entertained by how to cook. And those of us who love shows on the Cooking Channel and Food Network can kind of understand what would be the draw of something like that in person. And it was a big moneymaker for the newspapers. So that's what they liked about it as well. Now, newspapers also took the recipes that women sent in that their editors used and they put together cookbooks.
So the one on the left is probably one of the oldest newspaper cookbooks. It's a reprint, so it doesn't look old. Uh, it was first published in 1905, and it was from the Los Angeles Times. What's unique about it is the first half of this cookbook are all uh, recipes for Mexican food. And so it has the recipe. And it has the name of the woman and what city she lived in. So they would take this content, what we would call content today, they would gather it after it printed in the newspaper, and then they would put together cookbooks. So you can see there's the LA Times in California on the left, and then the Omaha Bee News from 1933. Sometimes these were, hold on, sorry about that. Sometimes these were from uh, readers, and sometimes they were from their staff. So here's an example. This is from Kansas. It's the Hometown News from Wichita. And uh, this one actually is from 1977, but they did this several times starting in the 1960s. So look at the information you can get from this besides just her name and her address. So Line Pickles, she talks about how her sister and she gives the address for her sister, uh, how this is she got this from her Lime Pickle recipe and how much they love them. And so it gives you the recipe. The bottom one is for wild grape dumplings. And it says she received this from a Native American woman. And uh, it's a woman who lives in Oklahoma and that the woman who provided it lives in Toronto, Kansas. So it's a Wichita paper, but the two women who are mentioned aren't in Wichita. So these cookbooks give us a glimpse of a community at a specific time. And it's a place where for some women, this might be the only time their names were published in something other than maybe a vital record. Now, since we're talking about cookbooks, let's talk about the first cookbook in America. Now, early American women or pre-American women before the revolution would have used cookbooks that were printed in England. And these cookbooks would have used ingredients from England, right? But you come to the new land, the new world, and they have different ingredients that are available to them. So the first American woman who writes a cookbook using American ingredients is this one, Amelia Simmons. Now, you can Google this American cookery, Amelia Simmons, and you can find copies of this cookbook in various places online. It's very easy to find. It has been reprinted several times. As you can see, uh, it actually, this one says 1798, but I think the first one was 1796. I love this because it gives us an idea of what people were cooking during this early time period. She even, she talks about turkey. She even talks about peacock and suggests you not eat peacock because it's not very good. It's kind of stringy. So um, she talks about foods that people would have been familiar with at that time period and how to cook them. Now, if we jump ahead in time, you know, between that time and the 1800s, you see other cookbooks as well. And largely, you're going to see cookbooks from women who ran cooking schools, uh, women who might have copied from other cookbooks. So you're going to see a little bit of everything. But if we jump to the 20th century, one of the most important cookbooks is this one, The Settlement Cookbook by Liz Lizzie Kander. Now, the first edition is from 1901. These are some in my collection, and I don't have 1901. I think I have 1904. But her idea was she worked for a settlement house, and she taught cooking classes. She largely taught it to Jewish immigrants, and it was an attempt to kind of help them understand what foods were available here, but also to incorporate their recipes as well. So it's a little bit of everything. And it was a way to teach people how do Americans eat? How do they set the table? What's appropriate for the table? So it's not just cooking. So she wanted to put this together and uh, make it available to everyone and charge. And that would make money for the settlement house. 
But those in charge, the board, didn't like that idea. So she went ahead and she financed this first edition of the Settlement Cookbook. This is still being printed and published today. You can buy it on Amazon. Uh, it looks different. My newest one is the one on the bottom right. I think the latest one was published in 1994. So you can still get this. Over time when Lizzie was alive, she would update it with new recipes and new things she had learned along the way. And so you really see, if you have multiple copies, the way this evolves. And although, you know, the tagline of this cookbook is the way to a man's heart, that really wasn't her intention. It wasn't here, women, you got to cook so you can get men. Her intention really was to help these women become more comfortable with cooking in their new home and to learn how to best cook and to have access to all of these recipes. Now, this cookbook throughout the 20th century was incredibly popular. I've heard from lots of people whose mothers got this for uh, for their wedding and, and all kinds of things. Now, this isn't the only one that would have been popular during this time period. The other one would have been Fanny Farmer. What unites both women is that they both push the idea of measurements and measuring ingredients so that you weren't just kind of guessing, that you actually used measuring uh, utensils, cups and spoons and all that to make sure that your food came out correctly. So Fanny Farmer was doing that in her cooking schools, and uh, Lizzie Kander was doing that as well. So let's talk a little bit about community cookbooks, because those are my favorite, uh, although I do like the settlement cookbook, too. So I have just kind of a range sitting here because I wanted to bring your attention to something. Community cookbooks are cookbooks that have been around since the time of the American Civil War, so about 1864, and their purpose is typically, but not always, fundraising, and women have used this to help benevolent groups that they are a part of. Now, in the you know beginning, they didn't have this comb binding, right, but that's what we know community cookbooks with this is comb binding or even a wire binding uh they were hardback books and so sometimes they can be hard to distinguish from other old books because they look like old books uh but when you get into the 20th century uh, i think it's about the 1940s that comb binding becomes a thing and it's a cheap way to publish books that's when you get community cookbooks using that comb binding now what kinds of places do we see putting together community cookbooks? You name it, there's a cookbook for it. So there is schools, occupations, uh, fraternal orders, sororities, churches is what most people know of, pretty much anything, genealogy societies. So everyone puts together these in order to make money. And then they sell it far and wide, and some are more successful than others. Now, what we know about these cookbooks is this. They tend to have the name of the contributor of the recipe in there, as well as the name of those who may have been involved in the group. Sometimes it has an address. Sometimes it has a photograph, but those are pretty rare. Sometimes it has the names of people who aren't part of the group, but are somehow affiliated with a member of the group. These can give us a sense of a woman in time and place. The other thing is she is going to provide recipes that mean something to her, that are her favorites, that she can cook well. She's not giving recipes that she hates or that she is, you know, it's lousy, anything like this. This is your chance to shine in your community. And so that's what she's providing. So unlike other books, other cookbooks from the same time periods where people may or may not have ate those foods, because sometimes cookbooks have things that are a little, um, you know, not quite what people would actually eat. Uh, you know, they have some recipes people eat and then some they're just kind of putting in there. These are things that people actually ate in that time and place. 
Now, these cookbooks, this is an example from Iowa from 1937, and it has a wire binding. So that's before comb binding. And you can see this is a page for meats and eggs. There's a jellied veal loaf. There's spring veal, scallop chicken. Uh, so all kinds of chicken loaf and, and all of that. So they have recipes. That's what we expect. But they can also have advertisements. Now, remember, they're fundraising tools. So you make money when you sell it. But you may need money to print it. And so how do you do that? Well, you do that by selling advertisements. And sometimes the advertisements are for a food uh, company that's nationwide. But a lot of times they're for local businesses. So I've put a few examples here. So that's helping them print this book and get it bound and getting out to the public. This means that these community cookbooks are city directories of women. Because not only do they have the women, largely, who provide the recipes, but they also can uh, include women-owned businesses. So they really provide a snapshot of families during this time period. It's a great place to see, for example, where the funeral homes were in a place. I've seen cemeteries advertised. Uh, you can see the one at the bottom right is from Houston, Texas. It's the Lone Star Market, and it has a photograph and there's a little boy and there's a butcher there and there's the carcasses on the side and, you know, to show that, you know, you should buy that meat. And it has the name of the proprietor and his address and all kinds of fresh meat. So those cookbooks give you recipes of the time period, give you women's names, but they can also tell you about that community. Now, some charitable cookbooks are... Uh, very successful. In fact, a lot of people who collect community cookbooks collect junior league cookbooks. These have been around since 1930. That's believed to be the first one, though. I did see one I think that maybe predates that sometime in the 1920s. This is a selection of some. Uh, there's one from Texas and the East, uh, gosh, I think that's a Texas one too, North Carolina, California. So this is one way that junior leagues since at least 1930, uh, the various junior leagues have made money for their benevolent causes. Now, I will just give you a warning because most of the time community cookbooks are women in that group providing the recipes and, and so forth. One of my junior league cookbooks, and I can't remember which one it is, in the very front said that um, they had one member who provided all the recipes and she got them out of cookbooks. So that doesn't give us the junior league women from that area. So make sure you read the front to, to make sure it's what you think it is. Lots of people write about junior league cookbooks. Uh, there's one, actually, I, I'm not showing, but there's one that I think it's been in print for something like 60 different printings. It's incredibly popular. So uh, they are a good example of a successful fundraising book. But then again, so is the settlement cookbook. Well, let's talk about this lady. A lot of us know this lady, right? Uh, depending on uh, when you were born and uh, when you remember her, she might look a little different. I remember the woman on the left. But uh, Betty Crocker came into being in 1921. She is not a real person, though uh, they led people to believe she was. She was a marketing scheme from a flower company. And so what happened was they would get letters from women asking questions, cooking questions, and the marketing department of men couldn't answer them. So they started asking the women and then they decided it would be a nice idea for all the answers to come from one woman who's there to help you. And so in comes Betty Crocker. Now, Betty Crocker had her own radio show and she had her own cooking school that was on the air. And you could be a part of this cooking school. You would uh, write in and you could gather, they would send you the lessons 
And I'm assuming you had to pay for that. And once you went through all the lessons with Betty, then you had a little certificate at the end that said that, you know, you had uh, successfully completed the Betty Crocker cooking school on air. Now, Betty Crocker obviously wasn't just one person. She was a team of home economic teachers uh, who worked for uh, General Mills. And they had a kitchen inside the factory where they tried new products, where they came up with recipes. Uh, they wrote articles. They wrote recipe booklets. So this was a group of women, though. Um, I think the women who there were only a few who portrayed Betty Crocker on the air. I think they tried to do a television show and have just one woman do it, but it wasn't as successful. So a lot of our moms, grandmas, great grandmas learned to cook via Betty Crocker, whether it was her radio show, her newspaper articles. Uh, here's a little guide to her radio show. In fact, here's one of the little um, scripts and she's talking about uh, different foods that um, we're going to learn to make like noodles, Cantonese, which is a salad of lettuce wedges with horseradish mayonnaise. That seems a little spicy. So, um, you know, you learned from that or one of the Betty Crocker cookbooks. And so probably a lot of people in here, and I think Heather has the Red Book, which is one of the most popular. Uh, this is my grandmother's Betty Crocker cookbook from 1956, and it includes color illustrations uh, like it says, it's a picture cookbook. Now, in my family, I don't know why, but no one ever wrote, hey, I like this recipe or cook this again. So I don't know what she cooked out of this. But uh, like I artifacted earlier, and I'll show you, they piled stuff in that might give me a little idea of some of the things that they tried to add to their cooking. So this is what I see when I open up that cookbook, and I have to be careful that it doesn't spill. And on top is some recipes from Uban Coffee. And my grandmother was a big coffee drinker, so and I know she drank Uban. So I know that this was her cookbook, even though she didn't write her name in it. And she would have got this probably sometime when her kids were teenagers, so this isn't when she married. It was later. And there's all kinds of different recipes she put in here. And then there's obviously the recipes themselves. Although she didn't write in her cookbook, there are some recipes that it looks like some cake or whatever got on there. So that might indicate what she actually used. So, you know, in these kind of cases, if you have somebody to interview, it might be a good idea. And I've done this with family cookbooks is to write on the side hey, we used to eat this every Wednesday, or this is grandma's cake recipe, or whatever. Now, this is my mother's cookbook. My mother was a big, or is a big fan of Campbell's Soup, and so she cooked many things from this. As we continue on the 20th century with various cookbooks that are available, you know, everybody has a cookbook. People who wrote food columns in newspapers like Clementine uh, Paddleford and Clay Craig Claiborne. There are cookbooks from Penny Prudence, which was also not really a person, but a, um, a group of different newspaper writers. Companies used cookbooks as a way to sell their product and teach people how to cook something. In fact, my guess is at Thanksgiving, you might have Campbell's green bean casserole. That was one of the women who worked for them who put that together as a way to sell Campbell's cream of mushroom soup. And so this is another example of a company putting together dishes so that you buy their product and you learn how to use their product in various dishes. Including hamburger 15 ways. So I'll tell you, um, hopefully my mom isn't watching, but my mother makes meatloaf with um, Campbell's cream and mushroom soup. Well, obviously she got it from this cookbook. My, uh, a family member could never understand why she did that because most people use ketchup. Well, that tells me she got it out of this cookbook and there is a recipe for it. 
Now, there's all kinds of cookbooks. And like I was telling them, I have my own cookbook library. We could go on and on and on about cookbook history. But I want to show you a few other things, too. Just so you know, there's various types of cookbooks. Uh, I showed you manuscript cookbooks. There's cookbooks that were aimed towards housewives, community cookbooks. There's classic co cookbooks. In fact, I'm going to show you one, which is The Joy of Cooking. Ethnic cookbooks like the Settlement House, advertising recipe booklets, celebrity cookbooks. That's a whole topic by itself. Specific foods like vegetarian cookbooks or A cookbooks, diet cookbooks, institutional cookbooks like the Army, uh, and then restaurant cookbooks. So really, there's all kinds of cookbooks. They've all been around for the 20th century. There's even cookbooks that are like community cookbooks, but they're for causes. So we know that women in the suffrage movement used cookbooks for a variety of reasons. One was to make funds for suffrage, uh, like this one. This is actually a reprint, though. The other is because there was such anti-suffrage notion that women in the suffrage movement were old hags who hated people and their families and didn't cook, it helped to show that they worked. And in fact, those women would uh, put recipes in newspapers, they would have cooking contests to show that they, just like all other women, have to feed their families. Now, suffrage cookbooks are, um, some are regional, some are nationwide, and included the big names in suffrage. Uh, so, and, and including men, typically, you know, I'm saying a lot of women, but there were men, including Jack London, who provided recipes for suffrage cookbooks. Now, events create cookbooks as well. So World War I in the United States, you know, is a very short war. It started in 1914, but we don't get into the war until 1917. But what happens is we are feeding the world because these countries that have been in the war for three years plus, they're losing men, they don't have people to farm, they're losing crops, uh, they're starving. So we start encouraging our population to self-ration. We don't force rationing. We ask that you self-ration and that the foods that are easily trans portable to other places, other countries, that you not eat those. That's where you get things like Wheatless Wednesdays and Meatless Mondays, and you get cakes that don't have flour. That's out of that effort. So this cookbook is one that was put together for a kind of a food expo to encourage women to uh, to feed their families differently and to feed them foods that we normally don't eat. So I will tell you this cookbook has recipes for whale meat. Now that seems weird to us today, but they did sell canned whale meat during this time period. Americans weren't going for it though. So it didn't really catch on. Now World War II also because of rationing brings up its own cookbooks, and they were created by the government, by companies, by everyone. Now, actually, that first little one there, Wartime Cook and Health Book, that's actually World War I, and that was put out by Lydia Pinkham, who's best known for her female remedies for all the various things that us women have problems with. Um, she had a cookbook. So you can see... There's all kinds of different booklets and cookbooks that were aimed towards uh, teaching women how to cook with their ration stamps and how to do more with less. Now, in case you don't know about rationing, just really quick, here's the timeline. Uh, you know, September or December 7th, 1941, we have Pearl Harbor, uh, FDR knows that we need to do something food-wise. So prior to that, before we get into the war, he sets up the Office of Price Administration, which is very similar to World War I's U.S. Food Administration. The first thing we ration is sugar. 
And these are rationed because it's too dangerous to ship them into the United States. Now, you may say uh, Idaho has beet sugar and stuff. Yeah, we did create our own sugar, but Americans uh, consumed a lot of sugar back then. And so that most of it was imported. Then after Thanksgiving in 42, coffee is rationed. And then you can tell from this timeline, then you get meats and dairy. Uh, all meat rationing ends on 23rd of November, 1945. And then all rationing, because it wasn't just food, it ends in 47. For other countries, it continued for a few years. So women had to be creative about how they cooked. They had to do without some things. And they had to use money plus ration coupons in order to do that. So it was a complex system that is worthy of a two-hour talk by itself. But because it was complex, in the newspapers, it would tell you how to use your ration coupons and how you would um, take so many coupons and so much money to buy various items and the newspapers would also tell you what stamps to use that week because there were uh, four ration books and what was good for what so it was something our ancestors had to have those newspapers in order to understand cookbooks were published by the u.s government and other entities like newspapers to give you ideas for how to create foods especially that didn't use as much uh prime type meats, uh, alternative meats that uh, Americans didn't eat as much like organ meat. Okay, let's talk a little bit about recipe cards as we get towards the end of our time together. Because although this isn't a cookbook, it becomes a big technology that is in addition to cookbooks. So recipe cards... Uh, our 20th century invention, they become something that uh, marketers are using with various food companies and even newspapers to spread the word. The first kind of wooden recipe box was gold medal, Betty Crocker, and it actually was this uh, box that I have here. Uh, these aren't necessarily the recipes that were in it. Uh you know, you could eventually buy index cards to do recipes and you could buy recipe cards that were personalized. And it allowed women to have parties where they would swap recipes, where that would help them to gather recipes. Uh, so they were really important as an addition to cookbooks. Kind of the social media of the time. So uh, here's an example. This actually was my great grandmother's. And so it says recipes, it's kind of falling apart, but you can see it's comb bound in the middle and you could insert recipe cards into little pockets. And one of the recipes she has is tomato cake. This was a very popular cake. I don't know if anybody's had it. It tastes like uh, spice cake. And that is also something you could probably thank Campbell's for. So these, uh, unfortunately, only one recipe has a name attached and it was a friend. So I don't get a good sense of, you know, okay, did she make this? Did she not make it? Except that this book is very small. And so my guess is that she probably did make this tomato cake and it is um, very messy. So I think she spilled on there too. Now, there's other cookbooks that you are familiar with, such as Joy of Cooking. Usually now it's called Joy of Cooking, not The Joy of Cooking. Irma Rombauer first uh, wrote this cookbook in 31. After the death of her husband, she needed to make money. The first cookbook actually shows a woman on the front, an uh, illustration of a woman fighting a dragon. So um, it's a really cool uh, cover. This edition is, I think, this one's from the late 40s. Uh, Irma continued to add to the joy of cooking. Her daughter helped later. Uh, her grandchildren helped. So it's always kind of been a family uh, cookbook, except that it was bought out by a big company. But you can still buy the joy of cooking. A lot of people learn how to cook from it. 
And we also get ethnic cookbooks, right? So this is probably one of my favorites because she's one of my favorites. This is a uh, Elena's Famous Mexican and Spanish Recipes by Elena Zelayeta. This is uh, a later edition. She first came up with this cookbook in the early 1940s, about 1941. She owned a restaurant in San Francisco at one time. Her husband was uh, killed in a bus accident. She later went blind. And so the women she had helped cook uh, and learn how to cook Mexican food, because she was from Mexico, talked her into putting together a cookbook. And so she did. And so it was reprinted. She was very famous for her time. Uh, I can't remember exactly when she dies, maybe about the 70s. And she had various cookbooks. Now, she's not the only woman. There were women who were famous for Chinese cookbooks and other what we, you know, sometimes call ethnic food. So we start seeing that. And these recipes also appear in newspapers and so women who are a little more adventurous with their eating start trying them and then want the cookbooks. And then there's recipe booklets that aren't quite cookbooks, but um, they're ways to market to consumers. They are premiums that consumers can purchase or send in, you know, different labels or whatever to get. This is um, one of my favorite foods, which is deviled ham. That's been around since the time of the Civil War. Deviled, anytime you have something deviled, not cake, but like meats and stuff, uh, that indicates that there's some kind of vinegar or spice element. So deviled eggs, right? have mustard some people i think put vinegar devil tam is probably got vinegar in it so it has some kind of element like that and so this uh book from the 30s is all about the really cool appetizers you can make with the devil tam and all kinds of companies put recipe booklets out everything from baking soda to um 300 ways to serve eggs to uh, candy tricks, to everything you can think of. I must have around 300 of these. So uh, <laughs> there's the true confession for tonight. <laughs> so you can find these for just about anything. Now, let's end or kind of wrap it up by saying, how do we incorporate food history into our family history? You know, I showed you cookbooks and recipe cards, but there's other ways you can do it too. You could uh, talk about heirlooms you have, like tablecloths and silver and china and aprons, like Ellen is wearing. Um, yeah, you can have things like that. I've got one right here, this little mold. Uh, you could talk about memories and holidays, Sunday dinner, Thanksgiving. That's one of the prompts I usually have people write about is Thanksgiving throughout their lifetime. What tools in your family do you have from the kitchen? Maybe a meat grinder, for example. What about gardens in your family? Did they have a victory garden? Did your family have a garden? Did you can? Did you have anybody who had a professional food occupation? I told you my great-grandmother, my paternal great-grandmother, who I knew, she was a cook, and she actually worked at um, a Greyhound Station diner and a Denny's. Uh, and then you could talk about difficult times. You could, uh, if you have ration books from your family, if uh, your family had uh, people who died during the 1918 flu pandemic, uh, you could talk about war. So there's lots of ways to incorporate your food history into family history. Now, even if, like I told you, I've got my grandmother's cookbook, but I have no idea what she cooked in it. But I can write about that cookbook and talk about the importance of it during that time period. Today, you know, 20 cookbooks come out each week, right? That wasn't always the case. There were a few handfuls that people relied upon. Now, let me just do a plug for your food history on artifacts. I wasn't asked to do this, but I wanted to plug since my cookbook is there. Um, you know, all those things I just talked about, you could put on artifacts. So I put the Betty Crocker picture cookbook and I put in the photo of all the stuff in there, like the U-Ban recipes. And I said, 
you know, this reminds me of my grandmother. Looking at that U band coupon reminds me of my grandmother. And having it just helps remind me of her. It doesn't matter that I don't know what she cooked out of it. I wish I knew, but I don't. But having it means a lot to me. And when I eventually, you know, go pass away, I want my kids to keep that cookbook because it has been in our family. So you can incorporate food history into your family history, into what you decide to artifact. All right, Heather and Ellen. Well, Gina, that was just too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> And actually, there were some really great comments that we need to circle back to. Um, yeah. Art, Art was bringing up that he, um, cookbooks for the railroads that had dining cars. Yes. Did you come across those? Yeah, I actually have one that was, uh, it, it, it's a reissue of one that my husband got for me at the Railroad Museum here in Sacramento, California. Uh, not here, but in California. So mm -hmm. yeah, and I know there are people who um, collect stuff like that. So definitely any anywhere where people ate, and some of those places we don't eat anymore is, you sure. know, places that you would find those kind of recipes. And I was wondering too, I mean, you might I mean, I was joking, but not like, I mean, if you don't want soup on a train car, it could get really messy. <laughs> I can't. Just, just wondering. Uh, Heather, you want to bring up another example? A uh, comment? It would help if I came off mute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Gina, we had some folks note, um, I think the cookie table tradition when you were talking yes. about this book. And that's a new one to both Ellen and me. Curious, what stories have you heard around cookie tables or what part of history do they do they hold? Um, so that's a new one to me too. And I had a friend who lived in Pennsylvania for a while and I think that's where they do it. Uh -huh. And he told me that people, that you have a wedding and they have like just, tons of different kinds of cookies that that's a big deal and then i guess obviously there's going to be leftovers so you would uh you know send people home i love that tradition i don't know much about it i i'm pretty sure it's a 20th century tradition but um i i love that idea and it would be great to have a cookbook based on that too I like your, your point. Of, uh, yeah, right. I like your point about sleuthing and seeing which pages got really messy because I was thinking about the the cookbook. I, I when I got married for my wedding shower, it was like a like you'd slide the recipes into these plastic yes. sheets, these pages, but a lot of them were recipes I I have never made just because. Uh, they weren't my type of recipe, but so yes. I think that they look very clean in the cookbook for that reason. But, you know, when you're trying to dig through it, it can be confusing. Yeah. And they still make those pages. You can uh, get little recipe binders. I have some and they make those pages where you could do that if you wanted to. Yeah. Um, but you're right. I mean, people are going to skip foods that they're not familiar with or that they don't care for or recipes maybe that are just too much work. Yep. Well, I hope that you'll artifact your uh, deviled ham recipe because I'm now deeply curious about that. And you also flashed a screen of three cookbooks. You had a little one from World War I on the front, but on the back left, you had a cookbook from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, which is where I went to undergraduate. <laughs> oh, okay. What my daughter right. is named after. So. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Does anyone have any other questions for Gina tonight? Um, we're seeing lots of Everyone's very happy. It was very fascinating. Oh, when someone said the original Viennese table, question mark, common at weddings in New York City, et cetera. Yep. Okay. These, these cookie tables are fascinating. I love that idea. It's a, it's such a fabulous idea. I mean, if you Google it, you're going to see pictures of people who've done it. And it's just amazing. I mean, making all those cookies would be a lot of work. Uh, yes. Gina, I have one question. Do you yeah. have a favorite cookbook these days? Oh, gosh. It's almost like your children, right? <laughs> I, so, I, I couldn't choose one myself. So I Yeah, so <laughs> Elena's cookbook is is probably one of my favorites. I've actually given a talk on her. 
and her cookbooks because I find her to be amazing. I mean, she's she's blind. She actually had a TV show before Julia Child did. It was on cable access in San Francisco. And she um, she's blind cooking and you could not tell. I could probably show it to you and you might not be able to tell. But what they did was they tied string around her ankles and they would pull it to let her know which way to turn. And the episode that still survives shows her son and her son is helping her. And so she'll say, you know, can you stir this and stuff? So, um, I, so I just find her to be amazing. So probably that, and I try to, every time I see her cookbook, she, she had about five, including the one I showed you, I try to get different versions of that cookbook. So I'll say that, but I also have a New York World's Fair cookbook from 1964. What is it? So I have a bunch that I just love. Yeah. Well, we've got, I think, time for one last question. And we just had Courtney write in to ask, Gina, are you a good cook? And do you like to try out the recipes in these books? So not all the time <laughs> do I like to try these out. In fact, I'll tell you a funny story. One of my World War II cookbooks encouraged mothers to feed their children a combination of juice and milk. And one of the recipes was tomato juice and milk. So I told my mother about it and she said she would try it for me. And I thought, great, I don't have to do it. So one day I'm at her house and she said, oh, I've got the juice and the milk so that we can eat it, drink it. And I'm like, no, no, that wasn't the plan. And I did try it, uh, and I was sick for a while after that. So uh, that acid and the cream, though I know people do make tomato gravy. <laughs> I, I'm i not probably the best cook there ever was. I think I'm decent. And uh, I try not to cook too many what my kids consider old, awful food because they don't seem to like that very much. But I do... Uh, sometimes when I give talks, I actually break out the deviled ham sandwiches and uh, give everybody a taste. Well, I okay. think maybe our next event has to be in person in that it case. Does. So, Gina, this has been absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and for sharing all your wisdom and stories. And I'll, I learned so much by listening to you about all the different types of cookbooks and how they highlighted women's history throughout the decades. Um, folks, if you're looking to rewatch this or share this with others, it will be available. The recording is available on our YouTube station, our YouTube channel, um, starting tomorrow. And it'll go out via e the link will go out via email as well. And then we invite everyone to join us next week when we have professional photographer Linda Pordon. Um, she has been published in a variety of magazines and media outlets. She'll be sharing tips for taking photographs, and also how to document family history um, with the use of photos. So with that, Gina, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your recipes, your stories, and family history. And we look forward to seeing all of you next week. <laughs> Have thank a nice you. day. Yeah. Bye.